We're going to talk about the colour printing. We've got basic, advanced and very advanced. And we're also, hopefully we're going to have enough time, we're going to talk about black and white printing, basic, advanced and very advanced. Now just because we've got to know each other on the first three doesn't mean to say that you can give me an easy time second half. Okay? I expect you to be every bit as uh, aggressive and ask me, the, ask me the questions, give me a, uh, you know, anything I'm saying that you don't agree with, do, do let me know. Um, colour management, I'm not here to impress you with knowledge or anything like that. I just want to get you to a situation where you can produce a print and that you are confident that what you're producing on the paper it is fabulous and accurate. I want it to be accurate. I don't want it to be an exaggeration of what you've captured. I don't want it to be understated. I want you to be able to hand over the same amount of quality that you've captured at the camera, that's this, that's this C, you passed it through the computer, see the monitor there with an M, and you've gone through to the printer. Now we've already talked about this printer. The printer has the capability of being fabulous and accurate. Your camera, hopefully, came out of the box being fabulous and accurate. And your monitor, you know what I'm like, I don't like these monitors. I don't think there's a single monitor out there right now that I'm aware of that does your print justice. That's my personal opinion and you're quite at liberty to disagree and to argue the point. I think the image that you see on screens or the projected image is a poor relation to the, to the quality that you've captured at the camera and the quality that you're capable of producing at the printer. The printer is fabulous and accurate when you make it so, the monitor always struggles to convey some idea of what's going on. Now, when we're talking about colour management, we can, we can ask you to print out a little checkerboard pattern of colours and densities. It's a little uh, single sheet colour uh, 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 printout. You send it to us, and we analyse it. It takes about eight minutes to analyse. It's ever so easy for us. We put a date, and we'll identify it with your, the model number of your printer, the type of paper you've used, uh, uh, and also your initials. So we've absolutely uh, got, uh, identified the, the, uh, the, the profile correctly. We email, we email it back to you pretty well lunchtime of the day of receipt. And the first thing that we want you to do is to test out that, uh, to test out the accuracy. Have you got a little, um, one of the little test, test images? I'll, I'll, I'll give it back, I promise. So you test out the accuracy of your printer uh, with the standard image that, that we send you. So that's the way to establish whether your printer is, is accurate. What we would also recommend you do is that you check that on a regular basis. Now, if you're an enthusiast, I would recommend that you check it uh, every six months? No. Every three months? No. Every month. Check it every month. Is the flesh tone accurate? And, and uh, Are your neutrals good? Are you producing a good rich black? Are your primary <coughs> colours okay? So long as your printer is is agreeing with your standard image that we all agree is, is absolutely accurate, you can count your printer as your second accurate colour device. Now, somebody has mentioned to me during the interval uh, of this business of colour space. This is a, a, an environment of colour. Now, there are a lot of camera clubs out there that advise you to use the, the environment of colour called sRGB. It's a fairly limited triangle of colour, and I like to use uh, uh, the professional uh, environment of colour, which is Adobe RGB 1998. 
So I would, I would recommend that you convert your, your image file when you enter your image into Photoshop uh, in your computer, you get it to convert it back to Adobe RGB 1998 because it's the full extremity of colour that the modern inks are easily capable of. If you put two prints side by side, I haven't got them here tonight, I'm afraid. I've got, a, I've got two prints, one of a, 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 a girl in a red dress. And you can, you can see the Adobe RGB version is a nice vibrant <coughs> red and the sRGB is a little bit of a tired version of that. If you viewed the image on its own, you wouldn't argue. But as soon as you put the two prints side by side, you can see the difference. Now we want to capture the real world as accurately as we, as we possibly can. So my advice would be to, you, to set your, your computer, your version of Photoshop, uh, or, or Lightroom or Aperture to Adobe RGB 1998. That's my advice for you. Now, as far as the monitor is concerned, if we want the best we can get out of the monitor, we need to be sort of honest with ourselves and, and uh, ask ourselves a few questions. Um, how good was our monitor when it was brand new? Was it a good quality colour monitor? How old is that monitor? Uh, those two, those two uh, 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 issues, which is the, the age of the monitor, that age, and the condition of the monitor when it was new. Now one thing about a printer is that we're feeding it with constantly uh, uh, new ink that's always accurate, and we're feeding it with fresh paper. So the, hopefully, if the data is correct, the output from the printer will be a constant. And we're constantly checking this as well, incidentally. If there's any variables that come into the printer, we can put them right for you by reprofiling. Now, when it comes to the monitor, on the other hand, it's a, con it's a, it's a resource that's constantly dying away. You've got three colour guns in a conventional uh, cathode ray tube monitor, and it's not a great deal of difference in a flat screen. You've got red, green, and blue values there that, when the screen was brand new, was quite vibrant. And then over time, it's gradually dying away, and it's dying away at various rates. So the answer you would think is to have one of these monitor spiders to put on the front of the monitor, and that makes the that makes the monitor accurate. But it doesn't really. It sort of equalises up the level of deterioration of the three values, so that you've got a reasonably level playing field as far as red, green, and blue. But it doesn't actually make it accurate again. And the other thing it doesn't do is it doesn't allow for our own personal perception of colour. Incidentally, while I'm on this subject, the absolute number one thing I talk about right at the beginning of my, my, my section on uh, certainly colour printing and also black and white printing is your, uh, you, you need to face the reality of your own health of your eyes. Now you need to, it, it's, a, it's a visual thing we do, and you need to have the, uh, uh, the confidence to know that, first of all, your eyesight has been, has been recently uh, 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 checked, and that you're wearing uh, 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 the correct prescription glasses, if you need your glasses, and also with colour blindness, of course. We need to be aware of our level of colour blindness, and the type of colour blindness, and nowadays the opticians are very, very good. Not only will they show you your the slight distortion in, in, in colour, but they'll also tell you what colours to look out for. And um, you know, you're looking at an orange, but actually it's a little bit more cherry red, for instance. So as you're aware of these things, when you're uh, in a club environment and you're you're submitting colour work, you know what your perception of colour is and where you're, you're, you're a little bit, let's say, you, you might be lacking in a particular area of green, let's say, as long as you're aware of it. 
you know, your, your eyes are, are the most important thing in this, in, in this equation. So, colour management and process control, we're getting our, our <coughs> printer accurate for us to carry out basic and reasonably advanced colour printing and basic and reasonably advanced black and white printing, we need a reasonably accurate guide on the monitor. So I'm sort of uh, going against my own uh, advice to a certain extent. So how do we do that? Well, what I advise you to do is do it the old way. Get your printer custom profile to start with so that you can then, you can then produce what you know to be an accurate set of colours and densities and neutrals. You then take this print that you know to be accurate and you bring it adjacent to the monitor and you adjust your monitor according to your own perception of colour and density until to your perception what you see on screen agrees to the print. It's not that we want the printer to agree to the monitor, we want the monitor to agree to what we know to be accurate. So we end up with our camera is an accurate colour device, we know that. Our printer is an accurate colour device because we've made that so. The final stage is to attempt to get our monitor to agree as closely as we can to our print. And I submit that you should check that on a weekly basis. So every week, you see what your standard image looks like on screen, and you'll see actually, even on very, very good quality monitors, you'll see gradually the appearance of, the, uh, of, of what you see on screen gradually dying away. Uh, first thing to do, what I tend to do, is to adjust the contrast on your monitor. That's the first thing. Then you adjust your brightness, so that when you squint your eyes, the, the appearance of the monitor agrees to the impact that you see when you're looking at your print under a good quality light. Now I've got a lovely light here, which is a graphite light. It's about 90 pounds. They do a cheaper version, which is very, very good, for about 45 pounds. Uh, but a, a, a standard white light it's, it's not bad. So when you view your print under a, a correct lighting conditions, you should then be able to adjust your monitor to agree according to your perception of colour and density. But you've got to be careful because you're, you're comparing apples and pears. You've got cyan, magenta, yellow and black ink sploshed onto paper and here We've got red and green and blue phosphors shining out at you. So we've got additive and subtractive colours, and we've got CMYK splashed on paper, and red and green and blue being radiated out at you. So as long as we're aware of this, we can make the best of a bad job. And when we've got a reasonably good agreement between our Print, uh, between our monitor agreeing to the printer and we understand this relationship and we understand that actually what we see here is not supposed to be absolutely accurate. It can never be because it's a different, it's a different type of colour. We can then start to understand the relationship of colour printing. Now the best relationship of all I would submit, this is my opinion, which you may or may not agree with, <coughs> when I'm dealing with very advanced uh, printing customers, um, the, the, the thing that, that binds a lot of them together is that they're looking for superb accuracy and fidelity between what they capture in the camera and what they're printing at the output. And they understand that you've got two things working against you here. You've got a monitor that will encourage you to over-adjust. Uh, over and you've got Photoshop, which is an incredibly powerful tool 
which actually, it, most of the time, is too powerful for you to use subtly when you're looking at the monitor as a guide. It's a little bit like driving up to the shops in a supercharged E-type Jag with an accelerator pedal that's all over the place and a, and a speedo that again is all over the place and you've got to sort of make a judgement of how fast you're going. Well, your passenger is saying, well, why don't you look out the window? Look out the window and it'll, sh it'll show you how fast you're going. You're putting your foot on the, on the pedal up and down and it's a bit, it's a bit weird because you've got so much power at your, at your disposal and you're, you're, fixated on this, uh, uh, you're fixated on this speed up. What you should be doing is looking outside and seeing how fast the trees are going uh, past. Now that's a sort of a rough analogy of what we're doing here. Now the reason I say to you that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the most uh, um, accurate prints are likely to come as a result of taking your image and coming straight through Photoshop and doing very little in Photoshop is when we have a custom profile printer we can start to trust that the, photo, that the printer will do its job. Once you've got a printer that has been custom profiled, you know it won't be exaggerating uh, a colour tone, it won't be understating it. If it's black, it will be black. If it's a bright highlight, it will be bright. Uh, and we've checked it. So we've got ourselves an accurate piece of kit. Now the problem here is that your, your, uh, your, your, your Photoshop um, was designed uh, years and years ago uh, as a, a very powerful tool for enhancing scans. Do you remember where we used to buy uh, um, a, uh, a flatbed scanner and we'd have a little bit of giveaway software with the scanner? Well that's actually how Photoshop started off, as Photoshop 1.0 and previous to that, I believe it started life as a thing called Image Pro. And it sort of converted across and it became a, a fantastic tool for photographers, but it started off life as a tool for graphic artists and designers and publishers right across the board. So we've ended up with a toolkit that's really, really powerful. Now the problem is, the monitor not only and you're only seeing a tiny fraction of the detail that the printer actually gives you because of the resolution and the number of pixels you've got there. But also, when you're putting a tiny little adjustment into Photoshop, let's say we've got an image. Let's, let's, uh, let's, have, a, let's have an idea here. It's really nice infrared here. So we've got an image here. And we, we want to darken it down just a little bit. <coughs> we just want to darken it down a little bit. So what we do is we look on the monitor and we darken it down until the monitor responds. Now the problem is, is the monitor, most monitors, respond in a very clunky way. You're putting 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, and then you see a change in the monitor and, oh yeah, well, that, that'll do. What we don't quite realise is we can take an image like this and we can run a number of test prints on our, uh, on our printer where we produce the, the first print as is, straight out of the camera. And you'll be amazed how good it actually is. The second test print, we put a little adjustment to it and we find that even a 1% a of change we can actually see it on the test print, and so on. And while these little test prints are going on, 1% and 2% and 3%, very little is happening at the, at, at the monitor, if at all. Now, one of our very great uh, uh, photographers, uh, Faye Godwin, she was the lady that, that taught me uh, this particular lesson, and I'm very, very grateful for her, for her time that she spent with me at the time. Um, she showed me that um, you produce your best work often straight from the camera 
you, 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 you take the image as is, you take it straight to the printer, and you see what that first off is. Don't sharpen it. You want to judge your level of sharpening that your camera has got built in. See what it looks like on, on, the, uh, uh, on the printer. A lot of the time, if you use your monitor as a guide to how sharp you want to be, what a crazy thing to do. Because we're actually using a monitor that is 72 dots per inch, which is big carpet tiles, to actually judge the end result, which in this case is 5,760 uh, dots per inch, which is absolutely tiny. So the chances are our fabulous origination is going to look sharp so long as the camera has done its job. So let's see if the camera has done its job on sharpening. That's the first thing. Oh, yes, it has. I've got a lovely sharp image. Let's not sharpen in Photoshop according to what we see on the screen. Let's also produce the print, their first half print, as is. And let's see if we actually need to darken the image or lighten the image. Now, one thing to consider is when you look at these, these modern screens, can you see what's happening there? Can you see that? Now, I suggest that you do the same to your screens at home. Change the angle of your screens and you'll realise that your judgement as far as density is wide open. You've got no control or, or no reference point for your density. But can we see what's happening here? The density is the density. Can you see that? So long as I've lit it correctly, you, you know, that is, that, that's what it is. So as far as adjustment, according to what you see on screen, you've got to be cautious. You've got one thing, don't take for granted the, 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 the sharpening element. Now, a lot of, uh, I've, I've had quite a few of my customers, they say that the flyaway hair is a problem. Because their flyaway hair, whenever they print it out, it's all clumped up and it looks awful. You must have seen this. And usually, this is because they've probably overcooked the sharpening or they've overcooked another adjustment. And what I normally tell them to do is to undo all the histories. Go back to the image as they captured it straight from the camera, produce the print on their custom profile printer, and I always check with them whether the custom profile is a recent custom profile. Because if they've got a custom profile that's dated more than, let's say, a year old, I would submit, and again, I'm being a bit controversial here, I would submit, I would submit that that profile is probably useless. So I would say that you should have recent custom profiles that have been recently checked that you can trust. Then you've got yourself a printer that you can that, that you, you can check. So already I've introduced the concept of uh, printing out your first off and also uh, um, checking your your density. Now, does any of you know pretty well the worst adjustment in Photoshop? The real, the worst Photoshop tool you could think of. What, what would you, what would you? Uh, Shadows and highlights. Let's see. Contrast. Contrast. Contrast, contrast, mm -hmm. contrast, which is which is linked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Contrast. I hate the tools in Photoshop or Lightroom or Aperture that rely on what you see on the monitor to sort of. De de decide your, 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 your reference point. And of course with contrast, you're totally reliant on what you see on the monitor. And it's a very, very destructive tool. In fact, pretty well everything you can think on it, of in Photoshop is, can be quite destructive. So I would submit that as you travel from basic printing, you see what we're doing now, I'm taking you from basic printing where you're relying on the monitor, okay? And I'm leading you away from temptation. Look at that, okay? So we're coming away from printing according to what you see on the, on the monitor. I'm starting to persuade you to use lots of ink 
and lots of paper. Well, I never. Look at this fellow. He's, a, he's an ink salesman. He's a paper salesman. And how surprising is that? That I'm, I'm, I'm. First of all, I'm telling you not to look on screen and don't take any notes of the screen. I'm, I'm encouraging you to do more and more printing. We're not quite. What I'm saying is, on your route from going from basic printing to advanced to very advanced, initially. I'm suggesting that you do a lot of test printing. You do a lot of test printing just so that you get a feel for what you're doing. So first off, let's say you want to produce, I don't know, uh, uh, an A3 uh, or an 11 by 17 uh, of, a, of, a, of a fabulous image. You, you know you've got a fabulous image. Let's, uh, let's, let's take a fabulous image here. We know that's fabulous. It's well lit. It, it, it should be fantastic. I want to be absolutely certain, and I'm on day one, and I'm learning. So what I would submit you do is to take that image, don't do anything in Photoshop apart from crop, and just print it out, unsharpened, unadjusted, print it out, Full page, that means A3, whatever size you're finishing, and make sure you use the same paper that you intend to, to, to finish up with. Okay? So remember, this is, this is first lessons in taking you from basic to advanced printing. I'm actually suggesting you do full size test prints. Wasteful, I know, but what we're doing is we're finding out how well our camera communicates with a custom profile printer. And the first off is likely to be actually pretty damn good. Once we've got that first off full size test print, we then do our second full size test print. And what you do is, according to what you see on the first print, you make a tiny subtle adjust uh, uh, adjustment and Faye Godwin, she used to say to me, if you're thinking of a 3%, cut it in half. Whatever adjustment you're, you think you need, cut it in half because your printer is capable of a lot finer adjustment than you think. And your monitor is a naughty child and it's, it's persuading you to over adjust all the time because it's just sitting there waiting for you to give it more sweets than it actually ought to have. Okay, so we, we, we're going we're gonna to hold back on this one. We're just going to give the printer tiny little adjustments. So we do the number two test print. And we hey, wait a minute. There was nothing happening on screen, but I have made an improvement. I've enhanced it. You do your number three test print, and perhaps you've gone too far, and then you come back. And then what you're doing is you're left with a lot of waste prints. And you've used a lot of ink. And you think, well, actually, I'm getting the hang of this now. Next time round, I'm not going to do full-size test prints. I'm going to do quarter-page test prints. And whenever I used to go to Faye's uh, studio, she had, a, 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 she had a, um, a, 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 a shelf going all the way around the studio with lots of little prints. And she was so good, she could get two prints side by side. And she would say, well, that's, that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible. Oh, that was beautiful. That was that, and, and I've got good eyesight. I have my eyes tested. I, I'm not colour blind. And I will put these two prints side by side. And this lovely... I think she was pushing 80 at the time. You know, she was looking at... She, oh, yeah, no. That's totally different to that. And I honestly couldn't see the difference. But she had control of her colour printing. And she had control of her black and white printing as well. She... This was certainly nowhere near subtle enough for her fine control, and she produced the most amazing work using this very advanced method. But she didn't go through lots and lots and lots of test prints. What was happening is that she started off, and I suggest you do this yourself, is you, you start off with full-size test prints right from the, right from the camera, Cut out Photoshop and introduce Photoshop sparingly and use Photoshop like a photographer, which means to say tiny little adjustments according to what you see on the test print. 
And then you'll get to a point where you're graduating from large size test sprints to quarter page test sprints. And to start with, you'll have maybe eight stages of test sprint. And as you get more and more confident and more and more knowledgeable about the adjustments that you know do the trick, you'll find that you're doing advanced printing with less and less test sprints until you're printing almost by intuition, almost. In fact, some of the, one of the sections in our, in our advanced masterclass is entitled Feel the Force, because that's a, a lot of what it is. It's, it's, it's getting the image up on screen, and, and really, you're the person that took the shot. You probably know what the lighting conditions, what the, what the atmosphere was, you remind yourself of the first off test print. I think you'll always need that first off test print just to see what ballpark you're in. But from that starting point, you'll find as you get better and better, your final print is just a few very small stages away until you get to a point where you're printing to a standard, well, let's say such as, such as this. Now this print is so good that you have a job to, to sort of gauge any sort of scale in there. You know, you, you imagine putting a human being anywhere in this, in this image, and, and you, you just, it's so pin sharp, and the, the actual origination was so clear on the day. You see, there's, there's, there's not a cloud there. That's as, that's as sharp as you're gonna get. And, the, and you know, that's, that's sort of evidence a fantastic origination, a custom profile printer, and very, very little in between. So that, I think, is the answer to very good level of colour printing, and as far as black and white printing is concerned, I think a similar thing applies. If we want to take ourselves from basic colour printing through advanced to very advanced, I think what we need to do initially is to find out how much quality we've actually captured in the camera. Most of the time I see bad prints that started life as very good origination, but it's been destroyed on its way through. And it's ended up in life on a... On a uh, um, a badly adjusted printer with an accompaniment of a monitor that also is, is, is badly adjusted. At least what we're doing here is suggesting that you have a, a recently custom profiled printer that, you, that you've checked and you actually test me out on this where you take your, what, what we have to assume is fabulous input we, we don't use the destructive nature of Photoshop. We see how good the image actually can be. And then we, 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 uh, uh, we make our decision on subtle enhancements based on what we've actually produced at the output, which is, according to my calculations, a matter of almost 18 times more detailed than anything we can see on screen, and of course, it's super sensitive to tiny little adjustments. Now, we've got to have uh, plenty of questions now. What questions have you got here? John, to avoid the subjectivity of the monitor, should we not be actually adopting this practice of straight from the camera into the printer before the, before the profiling? Now, I, I, uh, I, I knew where that was going to lead, because there are, there are printers with little, with little um, screens on them. Card, card, like card, that, slots. card slots. Now, I'm not suggesting that at all. I'm thinking that. Now, what I'm suggesting is, uh, um, what camera do you have? Um, uh, have a Nikon D700. Fabulous input. A D700. And a Now. Your, your, print, your camera tells the truth yeah. as far as colour, density, neutral, flesh tone. Yeah. It tells the truth. We're going to bring the images through a bit of software that's very powerful. I'm suggesting that 
instead of <coughs> squeezing it through this bit of software here with adjustment, let it have a nice easy path through Photoshop. That means don't adjust at all. Make sure that your printer is custom profile. This idea doesn't work with an unprofiled printer. I'm not saying that a print, an unprofiled printer is a bad thing, uh, 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 but it's, 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 not, it's, it's bound not to be as accurate as a custom profile printer. Here, you've got eight channels of ink, and we're hoping that the eight channels of ink give you a lovely, smooth graduation. You know the response curve that we used to get in the darkroom. Now, it would be nice to imagine that out of the box, this printer gives you eight beautifully smooth parallel response curves. Well, it, it, it doesn't. Not only does it not do that, but one printer compared to the next printer to the next printer, they do have quite different response characteristics according to the characteristic of the individual print head. We've seen all sorts of graphs that are actually actually show this to be the case. So the first thing to do is get your printer custom profiled and check it so that we know that the profiling is accurate. Once you've checked your custom profile, what you then do is then see how good your camera actually performs with your printer. You'll, you'll be amazed. It's it's it's. It really is a, a, a revelation. And then, this business of very fine tuning of your print. So you start with a full size number one, a little bit of enhancement, and oh, you can, you can see the difference. And another little bit of enhancement, oh, you can see the difference. But while you're looking at your screen, there's, there's very little going on on the screen. So you're starting to learn that Photoshop is probably four times as powerful as us photographers need it to be. Uh, some photographers do need it to be that powerful. They do need their vibrancy and they need strong enhancements and special effects and goodness knows what. Else. But we don't for a particular effect we're trying to go for. But my printer of paper and ink be profiled already when I'm <coughs> fiddling about and you know, sort of actually doing the damage on the, on the monitor. Can I still use that profile? and start from the raw material. Uh, you can, if I understand you correctly, what you do, so long as you're confident that your printer is accurate, what you do is you, you see what this new workflow actually does for you. I'm not advocating not using Photoshop at all. We love Photoshop. We all love Photoshop. But what we're saying is we need to be aware that Photoshop has a very... Uh, um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a great tool, but it's a very powerful tool, and we can damage the image just as easy as we can in, in hearts. Any, any, any other? What, what, so what is that raw conversion then? Because obviously, it's oh, shooting in more. Oh, I, love, I love it. I love it. Right now, if we've got a little scale of quality here and there, down the bottom. So we've got up the top, down the bottom. Okay. Now, let's say we've got all of this scale of quality. Now, in, this is my opinion, and I love being controversial because I like to stir things up a little bit. In my opinion, the advantage of processing in raw and all that, we're dealing with maybe 5% or 8% or 10% or 7.5% of quality improvement. Let, that is my opinion. I may be wrong, but I feel, in my experience, you're sort of looking at that sort of level of of uh, 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 adjustment. Um, the, the difference in print quality, which is what counts, we're not talking about what the image looks like on screen, we don't care. The, as far as the, the, the print quality is concerned, the, the difference between just printing out any old how and printing with a custom profile printer is massive. Absolutely massive compared to the little advantage you get with the, the, the finer points of RAW. Also, it's massive compared to the finer points of quality increase you get between TIFF and JPEG. That's a little bit controversial there. Again, it's just a personal opinion. 
and also the massive quality improvements you get by adopting a hands-off policy in Photoshop is massive compared to the, the fairly minor, I'm not saying they're negligible because that would be unfair, RAW is a good workflow, TIFF is a good uh, format over and above JPEG, um, Adobe RGB 1998 is definitely a better environment of colour as against sRGB and on our YouTube presentations we actually demonstrate and we get into tech but you've got to be careful I'm the one for sort of I want, I want to make the best improvements I can in the easiest way and rather than getting a book and getting into the technical in the quite complicated areas of, uh, of, of raw processing, I think I'd just go for the low hanging fruit, which is a custom profiled printer uh, working with Adobe RGB 1998, not using a very destructive uh, workflow which uses lots and lots of Photoshop according to what I see on the screen. You know, you can get massive increases in quality by adopting a, a good quality paper, using a free profile, have constant monitoring, a, a real, basically just getting more and more involved in, in moving yourself from like a basic way of printing through advanced into this sort of, this rarefied atmosphere of very advanced printing, which actually isn't that, isn't that difficult. Have these machines, um uh, managed to develop uh, a switching system between photo black and matte black that doesn't involve taking cartridges out and putting different ones in. Well, it's it's funny really because uh, we got uh, let's sh let's show you. So it's a we got we got black and white here and a black and white here. There. So we got two two good black and whites. One is produced on a glossy canvas which needs photo black in order to render a good rich black. Now this, uh, although it's a, softer, it's a softer image I know, but again this is a matte finished, a, a, a matte finished paper and it needs a matte black in order to achieve a good rich black. Now if we print that image on a glossy paper with a, a, a photo black, we lose our good rich black. And in the same way, if we use a if we use a photo black, look at these lovely black and white. If we use if we use a photo black on a matte paper, again we lose our good rich black. And when we lose our good rich black, all of the impact of the image goes. This would be all horrible and wishy-washy if we printed it with photo black. And this, this, I was holding it upside down, look at that. Let me uh, and this image, this, this glossy canvas, would, lo would lose all the impact if we were printing on, on, uh, on, on matte black. Now, Epson and Canon and Lexmark and all these all these printer companies don't ever feel that these printers are designed specifically for us photographers. They're not. The print engines are made in huge quantities over in China. There's a particular area of China where lots of they specialise in print engines and they make thousands and thousands and thousands of these print engines per day. Huge volumes of print and the, the, the actual uh, printer heads are made in huge volumes and they happen to have a pattern of eight channel uh, print heads and you can have 12 channel or you can have six channel but you can't have 11 and you can't have nine and the reason for that of course is the manufacturing process we as photographers we want we, we want what we want we actually want eight cha uh, nine channels yeah. we want eight, nine channels so what we, they actually do here is they have they have eight cartridges, they have eight tubes, 
but they feed into an, uh, uh, sorry, nine tubes, but they feed into, a not, into an eight channel uh, uh, print engine. So you've got a little solenoid there, and a little, uh, the two tubes going into a solenoid, and it changes it over. Hopefully in the future, Epson may decide to sort of change things across. In another branch of their printers, the, the, uh, the, the 2000 and the 1900 and the 1800, they actually did have a matte black and a photo black that's working uh, next to each other. But it does make a slightly coarser black and white. But funny enough, when you get a good profile on even a, a two-channel uh, black and white printer, it can make an extraordinary, extraordinarily good job of black and white. But to get fabulous smoothness of tone, you know, it's lovely to have three channels of black or, or, or more. You know, to, to, to get that lovely smooth tone. And of course, the, the other advantage I have to say, now we're sort of graduating towards black and white printing, is you've got to remember that at any time we can turn that into a sepia. Or we can quad tone, or we can tri tone, or we can selectively tone, or we can turn that into a lovely 1950s atmosphere where we start with a full colour image and we pull back the colour until we're left with maybe 15% of the colour remaining, which gives us a lovely 1950s feel to the image, which creates a lovely historical feel to, to what we're trying to produce. So we've got a new dimension in printing over and above anything that we used to be able to produce in the dark room and it's repeatable. How, how, how good is that? More questions please? Uh, a couple of minutes or so. Two more, options. yeah, yeah, a few more minutes. Uh, one of the options with uh, Lightroom, which is quite good with <coughs> and in RAW, uh, is to export in ProPhoto RGB, which is an even bigger gamut than Adobe, I believe. Yeah, but, but my answer to that is we've got to be careful because we've only got, we've got three channels of colour to play with. We've got red, we've got green and we've got blue. And the modern inkjet printers that we're dealing with are basically 8-bit devices. So we've only got 255 steps to play with. So we actually want to take we want to take advantage of all of those steps of red, green, and blue, uh, and we want to place them in the right amount, the right envelope that's that's suitable for our output device. Now the inks that we have, this is Epson inks, Canon. Whoever, uh, not just professional photographic ink, uh, 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 our own uh, uh, inks, but um, the, the, the standard uh, photographic inks are just about capable of reaching out to the triangle which is Adobe RGB 1998. It makes a, a very good job of getting out to the extremity. At this point in time, to my knowledge, it can't get out to these, fur these wider uh, um, colour spaces. So actually, you'd have the effect of clipping off certain extremities of, of, of colour. So the advice from um, the authorities that, uh, that hand this uh, information down to, to ourselves is that we should, uh, we should advise our customers to use Adobe 99... Uh, Adobe RGB 1998 because it's a good fit. Now one thing we shouldn't do, and this is at odds with most camera club authorities that we deal with out there, is that a lot of camera clubs are, are recommending that you only print in uh, sRGB. Now sRGB is a nice safe middle of the road restricted colour space and it seems a shame because the world is a lot wider than sRGB, and my, for my opinion, for what it's worth, is if our <coughs> output devices are capable of Adobe RGB 1998, why not let's set it, let's set it like that. When we capture an image from our digital camera, 
you've got the entire CCD capability has been captured. And what we're doing is we're actually putting over there a temporary envelope of colour, in this case Adobe RGB, like a little triangle of colour. Now we can always change that back to the, 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 the envelope that we started with, or we can go down to sRGB at any time in the, in the chain of, of, uh, of image processing. So we can change our mind at any time, but we haven't lost anything. It's not like JPEG, where we've, we've reduced something down, and we've lost some quality, and we try to bring it back up again, and we can't, reco we, we can't recover the, uh, the, the particular quality. You've got lossless JPEG and, and, and a lossy version. And if you, have a, a, if you have a vicious reduction in size, you've got to lose something. But with a colour space, it's not, it's not that way at all. It's a temporary envelope of colour, which we can come back again. So to keep things simple, to deal with this issue of colour space, my advice to you would be to capture and process and print in Adobe uh, RGB 1990. But if your camera is only capable of best RGB, you're not going to be able to do No. All the cameras that we're dealing with here, they're all capable of well in excess of Adobe RGB 1998, in, in, in my knowledge. Yeah. I think most cameras now have got the choice. <coughs> you've just got to make sure that you select in camera RGB. Um, but we've it, got sRGB as well. Um, but John's right, you yeah. know, and we always teach, you know, within our other workshops, RGB. And yeah. you've got to make sure that that is the setting you've got on the camera. Yeah. The, the last thing, really, is that if you do make a mistake and you've captured it in sRGB, don't worry. Get it into Photoshop and, and, and you can open it back out. The last question that somebody might ask at this point <coughs> is that when you're talking about 8-bit, what about 16-bit? To be able to edit in 16 Can't I? Okay. It if you a 16-bit image, at the moment, 16-bit images are too cumbersome for modern inkjet printers to to deal with. Yeah. the The current advice is that you should uh, remember that 16-bit images are big. Okay, you've got a lot of meat there, and your processing time is more. But if you're looking for ultimate quality, they say now that you should capture in 16-bit, you should process and edit in 16-bit, and at the last possible moment, you then come down from 16-bit to 8-bit and hand it out to your printer. Because your printer is effectively run by an 8-bit printer driver. Now that advice is always subject to change because they can bring other things in. So we're, we're, we're on a sort of a changeable bit of advice there. Sorry guys, um, the caretaker will be over in a moment to kick us out. <laughs> and we've got a lot of clearing up to do. Hope you've enjoyed it, thank you very much. <laughs>